Ambassador Bloomfield, you may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. <clears throat> um, I, I have prepared a statement and would ask that it be entered for the record. So ordered. And uh, I'll be pleased to discuss it in response to your questions. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm just going to make three brief points, and I'll start with the last point that I discussed in my prepared statement. Uh, you'll be aware that many retired U.S. military leaders have publicly called for the U.S. government to ensure that the residents of Camp Ashraf are unharmed. Their sole concern is the honor of the U.S. military, which extended a promise of protection to the residents of Camp Ashraf eight years ago. That promise has twice been violated by Iraq's military forces. U.S. laws governing arms transfers and security assistance, the Arms Export Control Act, and the Leahy Law enforcing human rights standards would appear to have been violated and must be upheld. Iran's leaders see a strategic opportunity here to harm our reputation and credibility as a superpower at a time when the future of the Middle East is being contested. Second, you will find in my prepared remarks reference to an independent assessment I wrote in August, which will, I hope, be part of the electronic record of this hearing. The European court cases dismissing terrorism charges against the MEK did not say that the MEK had repented and ceased its terrorist behavior. They said that the MEK's violent actions over two decades, from 1981 to 2001, all aimed at the regime in Tehran, had never been terrorism. I am very concerned that the American people are not informed about Iran's worldwide intelligence activities, deceptive information operations, and leveraging of hostages, trade opportunities, and nuclear talks in an effort to make Western governance accomplices in its war against these exiled regime opponents. The residents of Camp Ashraf are in danger today, but so is American influence in the Middle East if we do not connect the dots, widen our aperture, and better understand Iran's actions and strategic political objectives on all fronts. I thank you, sir. First of all, is this question of the impossible deadline we've heard of the closure of Camp Ashraf by December 31st of this year. That deadline needs to be extended, I would suggest, for at least six months to enable the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to put into place the procedures and standards to determine whether or not people individually meet the criteria of, um, of refugee status. And there's some things that follow from that in terms of the way those determinations are made. Then the process needs to begin, although it has already begun, of looking for countries which will accept and receive the residents of Camp Ashraf who've been determined to be refugees. And here the role of the U.S. government is critical. Uh, Colonel Martin. Uh, to my left is Lieutenant Colonel Julie Norman, who was the Joint Interagency Task Force Commander at Camp Ashraf as well and worked closely with the Mujahideen. The attacks that we have seen numerous times on the video is included in a very extensive packet I have uh, provided. Two of the people in there I wish to point out. One is Sabah. She was born in 1981 in an Iranian prison. And the other one is Majid, born in 1961, mechanical engineer, both educated in Germany. Having served at Camp Ashraf and worked with many people like Sabah and Majad, I can honestly say the, uh, uh, the residents of Camp Ashraf are not terrorists. And it was the Quds Force recently that was planning the Saudi ambassador attack. And our State Department, Department response then was, well, we need to see how high up the leadership this plot went. As the anti-terrorism officer for Iraq, I can assure everyone it went all the way to Khamenei. And then we have the rumors. We heard a lot of them, and I hope to, uh, today I'll be able to address a lot of those rumors and take them apart one by one. And I used to take them apart when I was uh, the base commander at Camp Ashraf, as did Julie Norman. We talked about review the FTO status, the fact and the law. Well, the fact and the law is they are wrongfully placed on that list. They're only foreign. They don't no threat against the United States. They were on my flank. And also, they, have, uh, they, they don't have the means anymore. So if we talk about the fact and the law, they need to be removed. And then I hope we have a chance to talk about this, putting them in a consolidated location, because I have even more information, I think, than the State Department. Sir, I thank you. I will proceed and 
uh, take whatever time I will consume. Um, let me get this straight, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Um, the massacre that has already taken place, until that is dealt with legally and the people who committed that murder uh, are brought to justice uh, or the uh, role of the government is defined, that you're suggesting that it is then illegal under current law for us to sell arms to Iraq? Is that? May I just clarify? Uh, yes. For four years, I had the delegated responsibility for arms transfers as Assistant Secretary of State for Political and Military Affairs. Mm -hmm. Under Section 3 of the Arms Export Control Act, um, every recipient of U.S. defense equipment uh, is required to utilize that equipment only for the purposes that it was transferred. And whenever there is a question of not using the equipment uh, in accordance with the terms of transfer, um, the State Department is usually required to file a Section 3 report to the Congress that explains the circumstances that have called into question the use of the equipment. And, and it, in, in the event, the law does point to a cutoff of arms in the extreme case that, that an egregious misuse of weapons. That's a very rare occurrence. Uh, I saw it once, I think, in 1982 when Secretary Weinberger found a... Uh, a casing of uh, cluster munitions on a pile of uh, appeared on the New York Times in a pile of rubble in Beirut, and he terminated weapons to Israel until such time as uh, they they uh, worked it out with the Americans. We now have a video of our arms uh, shooting down innocent uh, women and children, uh, in and Iraqi army officers engaged in aiming their rifles and shooting the gun themselves that we don't retaliate at all against that it's open-ended uh, the state department is not always the fastest agency to answer the mail and uh, section three reports have been known to take months to deliver well, uh, ambassador bloomfield uh, made it a point to suggest that he had studied the background of uh, the mek and that he believed that even the MEK of 30 years ago uh, was not, uh, and it has been adjudicated by whom that they are not, they were not a terrorist even to that point. There's a 140-page judgment in the British court system that goes into great detail. There's a ruling by the counterterrorism magistrate in France this past April. Uh, they both consistently uh, judge that terrorism is not uh, the characterization for the activity that's been uh, that's yeah. been Let me ask you about the gap, Mr. Ambassador. We had a, a witness here from the State Department, and his main uh, testimony, the major part of it, was a history of the MEK. And uh, where did you find areas of uh, disagreement with that uh, history? I, I don't want to uh, focus solely on Ambassador Freed, who's a colleague and a, uh, someone yeah. I've admired. He's trying very hard to do. But we know we can disagree with someone and still respect them. I think that the position he was he was repeating it was consistent with his department's position, and I think the box that the State Department stands in is the one that says, "I'm not looking at the other side of the conflict. I'm just looking at acts of violence by one group. Here's what they did on that date. Here's what they did on this date." Nobody is disputing that armed resistance was part of the MEK's history. The question is, how did it start? What was their purpose uh, in the past century? You know that when the colonial era started to end, countries were nationalizing oil. They were, and Iran had a group of students that wanted to have their own autonomy. They didn't want to be dependent on foreign powers. They'd had a, a serious issue with Russia going back many years. Um, and of course, the coup against Mossadegh, who was a nationalist, restore the Shah to power. These were intellectuals, and even uh, you can read the papers. It's in my. It's on the record of this hearing. You can re you can click on all the links, and you'll see that in 1980, Masood Rajavi had thousands of students on the lawn at Sharif University, listening to him quote all the political philosophers, probably on the liberation side of the, of, of uh, you know post-colonial liberation. So we can have a, a dispute over whether we had the identical politics um, or not. But that was the genesis of the group. They believed in something. They didn't believe in violence. They believed in rights-based democracy. Uh, 
we showed Jackson Lee, who's not a member of this committee, who wanted to come in and make a statement that, and we were just running out of time, but I wanted to give her at least some time to get something in. And right there at the end, I think that was very profound, the point she made, and I wonder what you would thought of that, is that the suggestion that the president not meet with Maliki until he has agreed to at least extend the deadline on Camp Ashraf. What are your, all three of your opinions of that suggestion? Go right ahead, Colonel. Sir, first off, it's an outstanding suggestion. Maliki has been getting a free ride from our country. 2002, he was a street vendor in uh, Damascus, Damascus. Now, three years later, he was the prime minister. That man has made billions off the United States. And it pains me to see how much money this guy is getting. Joe Biden went over there and came back and said, oh, we overestimate the Iranian influence in Iraq. No, we don't overestimate. We underestimate. And the people in Iraq on the streets can't believe it. Somewhere, Maliki has to be made to understand that we're not taken in by his hype. And we are getting a solid understanding of what is really going on inside that country. He has been working with Ahmadinejad and his national security advisor, Rubier, has been feeding Iran all kinds of information. So what Sheila Jackson had said, I greatly think is a good idea because somewhere we need to bring this guy under control. And I also think telling Iraq, you're not getting all this money because we're tired of making your people in positions of power very wealthy at the expense of the Iraqi people. Except Kurdistan, they're living in poverty. Sir, I yield. Okay. Dr. Paris. I was very intrigued when she asked that question. It seemed a very direct response to a, a very difficult situation. Um, I think the U.S. has a lot of diplomatic economic tools that can be used to make it clear that there are certain limits. The deadline must be extended for closing the camp. The solutions must be found, and we should use every means we I didn't know about this Section 3, but to me that sounds also like something we should pursue in terms of the way that the arms that we have supplied have been used. And I uh, will just close with some following observations, and that is, uh, number one, uh, the Mullah regime will someday fall. And let us make sure that these uh, brave souls at Camp Ashraf, uh, who have stood as a symbol of resistance to the Mullah regime, are able to go home to a free and democratic Iran once the Mullah regime is, is over. And uh, that will happen. The Mullahs are not a democratic government. They are a government that re totally represses their opposition, controls the means of communication, uh, and, and actually rules that country uh, as a theocracy. And that is not the will of the Iranian people by a large number of the Iranian people. So let's hope that that day comes soon. Uh, we're not doing this just because we owe it to the people of Camp Ashraf as human beings. We believe that God gives rights to all human beings. We respect them. But we're also doing it because this will have a huge impact on the stability and the well-being of the entire region and the world. And yes, the stability region, uh, and security of the people of the United States. Uh, so uh, this hearing, I think, has added a great deal to the discussion. And hopefully it will uh, uh, result in action being taken in these next two and three weeks that will prevent another tragedy like we saw just a short time ago. And with that said, this hearing is adjourned.